When I see the insiders of a company make a huge purchase, it gets my interest. And that's what we've seen recently with Snowflake stock, S-N-O-W, where the new CEO, Ramaswamy Sridhar, bought around $5 million of the stock. This is Snowflake, around $158 per share. This follows another purchase from an insider just a few weeks ago for $500,000. And so this is an interesting development to see, especially given that the stock over the past month has lost over 30% of its value. Could this be a potential bargain purchase? This is what I like to see. I love to see insiders buy. I love to have that alignment personally. I view, you know, I I view investing as, you know, you have a choice when you're investing of what type of games do you want to play. Warren Buffett has one type of game, you know, where he's saying, I want these very steady free cash flow generators. He may not be getting hyper growth, but he is getting something that's very durable. You have other people that are saying, hey, I want to speculate on businesses that may, maybe they haven't proven out their business model, but if they grow really fast, maybe they can win that way. So I personally, the, the investment game that I personally like to consider is I want to align myself with management where I see that there's real skin in the game because then there's that lower risk, in my opinion, of either poor execution or decisions where management is making the poor capital allocation to reward themselves in management or some other party versus shareholders. So this is the type of alignment that I want to see where you're seeing real purchasing from insiders, the new CEO of Snowflake buying over $5 million worth of stock. You see over the last year, Snowflake stock has been beaten up partly because the valuation was previously so high, but still down nearly 40% over the last few years. Been sort of heading nowhere, making you know new higher lows. So maybe this is a new you know bull, bull market trajectory that we're heading into. Looking at the fundamentals, I mean, that stock chart would say, hey, this is a, a lousy business. Look at the fundamentals though. What what you really have going on is a valuation that was too high coming down while the underlying fundamentals are filling, you know, backfilling. And look at, I mean, look at this revenue growth. This is incredible results. You can see all their, you know, historic financials at AI Ticker Chat. Uh, we, we offer the historic financials uh, for free. Uh, you see the link below if you're interested. And you can also see how their free cash flow has also just done incredibly well going from burning to generating nearly a billion dollars in free cash flow per year. So this is a very interesting development, you know, very strong fundamentals. And then let's look at some of the holders, Altimeter, uh, Brad Gerstner's firm. He's won, you know, something like 40% of his fund is in Snowflake Berkshire Hathaway. Okay, so, I, you know, earlier I was making the comment that Warren Buffett prefers the, you know, steady free cash flow, not necessarily hyper growth. What they own, they own Snowflake. You know, th this is the, the the definition of that other type of you know portfolio company where it's you know it's proving out their margin. So I think this is an example of one of his lieutenants buying it, buying in Snowflake, and he owned it years ago. I think I think invested pre IPO or at the IPO, and you can see a lot of you know very astute investors in Snowflake. So this is you know it's an interesting roster. It's interesting to see the alignment. It's interesting to see the fundamentals. You see the stock price off. I mean, these are a lot of the things that I personally want to see. So let's let's do a quick overview of what is the business. When we think about Snowflake, Snow provides a cloud-based platform service or platform as a service, PaaS, that makes it easier for companies to store, access, and analyze their data all in one place. And keep in mind, this is this is empowering, you know, merchants that, you know, or, or businesses that say, hey, maybe they want to have, you know, their data in their processing done in one cloud, let's say Google's cloud for one function, and then they want to have it in Amazon for another. They are agnostic. You know, Snow says, hey, we, we're happy to work with any of these hyperscalers uh, and we help you. So that way you can minimize the amount of time that you want to spend in terms of focusing on the infrastructure. And, you know, we're, we're helping you reach your data insights. And they also have this data cloud. And this is very interesting to see, which is a centralized platform that enables secure data sharing and collaboration across organizations. So outside the company, offering unparalleled, possibly unrivaled access to diverse data. This is really interesting because, you know, you're looking at potentially thousands of customers in their data cloud. And this, this becomes sort of like a marketplace type of offering. Because if you think about, hey, 
you have an exclusive data set. You don't necessarily want that data leaving your company, but you might be willing to offer other companies a preview or they, where they can access it without actually having to pull the data. And so this is the advantage of this data cloud of saying, hey, if you need this data set, maybe it's the weather, maybe it's sales data. I mean, you could see a lot of different customers that they have, you know, they have, you know, telecom, they have finance. So you could have these companies that are either competitors or not related share very specific data lines if it makes them better. And for example, I mean, I'm, I'm not going to say this happens, but it is possible. You would think if you have a couple of different competitors sharing certain types of data, you can get more rational pricing because you're like, oh, this person's going to, you know, offer where, you know, this person on average, this company is on average offering a rate that's X percent uh, or X pricing. You know, let's let's keep it in line with that. So that way we can both make a profit. So you, you might see that sort of dynamic being enabled here. It's, it's unclear. There's a lot of customers though. So it wouldn't surprise me if that's one of the types of cases, but a lot of the cases I'm sure is also sort of, you know, this is a data point that's completely outside of our business model. Maybe you have a, a travel booking type of business and they're pulling in weather data from a company to say, oh, okay, you might have what, you know, inclement weather at this point that that would impact, you know, the, the whether or not you'd expect to actually make it to your hotel on time. So there's a lot of different aspects to how data sharing can be extremely valuable. And also this truly could make it an unrivaled business because when you think about these companies that are uploading their data to this data cloud and how it's growing at an exponential level, uh, it's not likely that they're going to say, hey, we need to go upload it to three other companies. Once you have a marketplace like this and you reach some sort of scale, there isn't that need. And so you say, well, this is the go to if you want to share your data, you're going to go to Snowflake. So that is an important investment that they're making, I'd argue, in making them, you know, making themselves unrivaled in the years ahead. So these are developments that I do like to see in terms of the business. And I think you see it in the numbers. You see, you know, revenue growth, you know, around 38% last year for their product revenue in the most recent quarter closer to 33% net revenue retention rate 131% so that means even if they didn't sell any new customers just their existing cohort grew by 31% in terms of revenue their core customers you know customers that are spending over a million dollars growing by over 30% close to 40% net promoter score of 67 Broadly speaking, this means most customers would refer Snowflake saying, hey, we like it. And this marketplace listing referring to the data cloud, you're talking about thousands of merchants, thousands of customers, businesses saying, hey, we're willing to sell our data at a price. And so you start having this marketplace dynamic that I do think makes them unrivaled with this data cloud, also with their core platform as a service offering. So this is a very interesting company. So then the question is, well, why is Snowflake stock you know, just gotten absolutely crushed recently, this 30% drop, maybe, maybe absolutely crushed a little too strong. 30% drop though is, is quite a haircut. Uh, so looking at it, looking at the developments, you see that Frank Slootman, who is the former CEO, he stepped down. That was the announcement in the most recent earnings call. And that was disappointing. He was popular with a lot of investors. The stock lost about 20% of its value during that time. They did, however, appoint Sridhar Ramasamy, Ramaswamy, Apologies if I uh, massacred the butchered his name, uh, who you know previously was the head of Google Ads, uh, and and he came on board when the company bought a, an AI search engine, Neva. I believe he might have been the founder of Neva. I think, and so it's it's interesting to see you know him come on board that way. I think you know the key aspect here, the key aspect from that last you know visual was. Frank Slootman was really appreciated by Wall Street. A lot of people thought of him as a, you know, like he he had been at several companies before ServiceNow and his track record during that time was very good. I think his own net worth was several billion dollars just from the stakes he's gotten in companies over time and, and his execution. And so he was known as a, like a trusted commodity. People were like, oh, you could count on him. So to see him leaving is disappointing. I think another key aspect on why the stock sold off is because their their revenue is just decelerating at a very significant pace, seeing their product revenue 106% growth in fiscal 22, 70%, 38%, then they're guiding to 22%. So that is disappointing, you know, for investors. And we'll talk about that guidance in just a second. You know, is that realistic 22%? 
Another key aspect, and I think people are getting concerned, it's, it's never just one thing. Oftentimes, it's, it's you get a Lollapalooza, and that's why you see something sell off. So you have the CEO. Why is the CEO leaving? Oh, it's, you know, sales aren't going the way you'd want. They miss internal expectations. And then you see another aspect, and this might be just smack talk from a competitor, Databricks CEO, saying, look, their competition, we put a lot of pressure on them, and they realize that AI is important, uh, you know, suggesting that their pressure is part of the reason why Frank Salutman left and Snowflake was basically not doing AI whatsoever. It's unclear to me that that's actually the case because if you you know go through their 10K, it's very clear AI is very prominent in the business in terms of how they're thinking about the dir direction of this business and how important AI and data is to the business. But you know maybe there's an element there with Databricks. I, you know, I'm, I'm not in the weeds as much. If you have a perspective on it, would love to hear it. First of all, on full disclosure, this is not advice, you know, as we start thinking about the valuation of Snowflake, and we'll talk about that in just one second. But first, a quick plug. Just last week, a premium member of the Unraveled Investing community shared on our exclusive Discord. This is a direct quote. Currently, the profit I have made thanks to called out ideas from Daniel can pay for 30 years of subscription. But the most valuable part has been the learning experience. I've been a very satisfied member since June 2022. Since then, I've never doubted to renew. Thank you very much for that kind feedback. If you're interested, if you're interested in compelling investment ideas, come check out Unrivaled Investing. For the premium members, I do have this Discord section. I personally let you in, and as this subscriber mentioned, it is largely focused on learning. We're all students, and how do we get better? We by all sharing and and you know sharing the insights that we that we're all learning on this journey. Looking at Snowflake, thinking about this business, one. I, you know, when I want to make sure I get that alignment, I talked about earlier in terms of games you play. For me personally, I want to make sure I get the alignment. And there's a couple of different ways you can get it. One is that you either have a founder led business, you know, where, you know, they own 20, 30, you know, 40% of the company. And you're like, oh, they, that's great. There's that skin in the game. Another way is looking at if you don't fully trust management, do they have, very clear capital allocation priorities where they're saying, hey, 100% of the free cash flow, it's going to go to you. That's another way of sort of de-risking management. The other, and I'd say a third way is, do they have a past of execution, even if they're new? And that that would need to be the key one because here you're you're looking at a business that really their margins are, you know, very low margin um, because they're still scaling. Yes, they're generating around a billion dollars in free cash flow, but there's a lot of stock-based compensation there. Um, so it, it is important to recognize, like, you need a judge management based on their track record, I think, uh, when you're looking at this. And so looking at the new CEO, you know, he calls out, look, he was one of the early employees at Google very early as an engineer, helping grow their ads business from $1.5 billion to $120 billion. So he helped oversee the ads team. And he also talked about he has long and deep experience uh, working with the biggest machine learning systems ever built on the planet, talking about Google search. Uh, he also, also talks about helping with YouTube advertising, I believe. So I look at this track record and he's seen the playbook before. This makes your investment journey a lot easier when you're when you're talking to someone or you're seeing someone that's saying, hey, I've seen 100x before or I've seen 50x before. And so when he's saying, I've seen this before and I I think I, I can do it. And he has a history of, of execution. Uh, and this is in his first rodeo, there's greater conviction that you could sort of align yourself. So this is a favorable development. I think Frank Slootman, yes, investors were initially disappointed. But if you think a little bit about this new CEO, you're going to say, yeah, this is very reasonable. I mean, this is a, this is, sounds like seems like a great contender. And the second key aspect this low or disappointing guidance. Is it because of worsening competitive dynamics? Not necessarily. Let's see what the CFO had to say, where he talks about how, yes, consumption trends are good right now. And part of the reason why, you know, they they put this guidance was because there's a new CEO coming on board. We have so many new products coming. We're not going to forecast those until we start seeing a history of consumption. So there's very conservative forward guidance here where they're saying, hey, we're going to launch new products and we would really like to see Sridhar succeed. So this is in this one comment alone, this, you know, 10, 30 second comment. You quickly get a sense that management is purposely setting the bar very low in terms of their guidance going from that, you know, high 30% growth to 22% growth in product this next year. 
it seems like they're purposely playing the Wall Street game of saying, hey, let's artificially set it low. So that way, when you can, you know, deliver 25 to 30 percent, then Wall Street loves you. Valuation expands and, you know, rinse and repeat. And so I, I think that type of comment about consumption trends are good. They're not including new products and that they want to make sure that the new CEO succeeds. That's all you need to know that there's a good chance the upcoming quarters uh, outperform in terms of the underlying guidance, in terms of the revenue growth. So they're, they're likely lowballing it, I, w I would suspect. And so based on that, you know, I'm going to provide a range of growth for this next year of 25 to 30%. That's certainly higher than what they were guiding to. And so looking at the stock price, even though it's down 30% in the past month, it's still a $60 billion company you know, generating around, let's say, a billion dollars in free cash, a lot of it's stock-based compensation. This is not really a cheap company, though. It is important to recognize that. This is still not, you know, a dirt-cheap company by any means. You're, you're, you're looking at a company trading at a mid- to high-teens price-to-sales multiple, a, you know, a fairly elevated multiple on a price-to-free cash flow basis. So thinking about, you know, where does it go in the years ahead, in order for, I'd argue, for it to do well, you need to see closer to 30% growth this year, closer to 30% plus margins, nowhere near that now, and 30% growth in the years ahead, and maybe a 40 times earnings multiple. And maybe, maybe that's warranted because it's a special business that's creating this data cloud. It could be unrivaled. Looking at all these data points, maybe you could get to 100% upside over time. I broadly look at this and still think that this is a company that's executing broadly, fantastic growth, fantastic free cash flow developments. You know, this is heading in the right direction, but it's very possible. And keep in mind, hypothetical valuation framework, stock price can go higher or lower, uh, depending on how does management execute, depending on sentiment. I personally look at this and I just think it's just not enough compelling upside to get me excited. That said, hold on a second. There's, there's more to it than that. So from a long-term investment perspective, which is my type of journey. I prefer to say, hey, can I pencil out 300, 500% upside and, you know, 200% sort of on a minimum. And if I can, and I could say, hey, that it looks compelling. I got the management alignment. Then I buy it and I just sit tight. I, I, I'm not looking to be hyperactive. I'm not looking like I'm looking for long term partnerships, very low turnover. That's personally what I'm looking for with my portfolio. And it's also a journey. I, I like to get to know, you know, the CEO a little bit more over time. You know, the founder, I like to read their story, listen to their comments. You know, if they if there's a book they read that they recommend, like I, I, I it becomes more of a journey, like a more of a personal aspect. And I enjoy that aspect. So, look, everybody's going to have their own journey looking at this setup this hypothetical framework, it's just not super compelling for me as a long-term focused investor. If I were a trader, however, if I were looking to say, hey, you know, I'm going to trade this, if I were a hedge fund, you know, looking to say, hey, I have to generate returns right now to justify my fees and to raise capital. If I were playing that game, I would definitely be more mindful of snow because Traders will say, okay, there's a good chance they're going to beat expectations, in which case, even though it's already at a lofty valuation, the valuation can expand further. So I'd say that type of game, there's a very good chance of that type of situation playing out as a trader, seeing this, this very conservative commentary from the CFO, seeing this $5 million purchase from the CEO, um, you know, seeing the CEO's background in scaling businesses, like those data points, Mark, you could say, okay, you quickly write the thesis. And I'm, I, I bet you there's going to be some hedge fund analysts because I know there's, there's some hedge fund managers that are part of my community and there's some, you know, sizable investors. I'm sure there's going to be somebody that's going to do something like this that'll they'll write up their memo on monday and be like boop you know <laughs> this is why we're gonna buy you know snowflake stock i personally don't own it no skin in the game i'm just sharing the thesis so you have these different data points the flip side to it is that this you know this five million dollar purchase most people would say hey that's a big buy i personally look at the background and like wait a second if you actually oversaw google ad revenue go from let's say one two billion dollars to a hundred billion dollars yes you're likely you know, first of all, fantastic execution, great job overseeing that. But on the flip side, you probably made tens of millions of dollars along the way. So this $5 million purchase probably isn't like an all-in bet. It's probably just a bet to sort of say, hey, I have skin in the game. 
but it's by no means a life-changing bet for the new CEO. So that is a data point to consider. Overall, though, thinking about Snowflake, this is a great business. Uh, and I think what they're doing with the data cloud is very, very interesting. I'm very curious to see how this develops further over time. Uh, I just ultimately think that there are probably better bargains out there. And I have trouble thinking to myself like, oh, I want to pay, you know, and, and assume that 40 times, you know, a multiple five years from now is super compelling. I just don't, I just don't quite see that. Now, if you have a different take, I'd love to hear it in the comments below. Uh, but I hope this video has been helpful for you talking about the different perspectives, traders versus long term investors. And it is interesting. You know, I, I'm, you know, I, I'm talking about how it's not really a right fit for me, you know, as I'm trying to think about being a long term investor yet here it is Berkshire Hathaway owns it. So you might say, Daniel, what are you talking about? So anywho, I, I'm sharing these different perspectives. I hope that it's helpful for you. I personally find the story to be very interesting and look forward to watching them execute in the quarters ahead. Thanks so much for tuning into Unrivaled Investing.